What is up, everyone? Brandon First, aka First Report, representing the first Off the Bench Podcast Network. Everyone comes off the bench. We are first. Welcome into another edition of In the Paint. We break down everything that NCAA men's college basketball has to offer for us. And of course, when I say we, I mean myself and my co-host, Raider Jim Martinez, who you can find at Raider Jim 1090. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. Hard to believe that we're sitting here listening to the basketball bounce off the court already. And who knows, you know, before too long, uh, we're already talking NFL or yeah, NFL playoffs. Yeah. And it'll be in a blink of an eye. I'm sure we're going to be talking about March Madness. Yes. Can't wait for that. Uh, that's always, of course, the, 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 the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that is the NCAA season. We were denied it a couple years back. Um, We'll, we'll start, unfortunately, there. Uh, there are more contrasts than just uh, with the NFL and NCAA than just realizing, wow, we're already this deep into things. Uh, we started last night's podcast talking about COVID, and we are going to do the same here on the NCAA side. Obviously, um, first and foremost, Tulane um, out in New Orleans. They have canceled the next two weeks of basketball activities due to an outbreak internally, and turning, including their coach, um, uh, Ron Hunter, I believe is his name. I know Hunter, he was a part of, I think it was Georgia Southern or one of those little miracle runs. I remember he fell off of the, uh, the, his, his wheelchair. I remember that story, but he had, he's moved to Tulane last year. Um, he actually had COVID and it kept him down three or four days, uh, bedridden. Um, so it was not, you know, the old kind of asymptomatic, or I got a little bit of a sniffles, this almost, you know, uh, it definitely took him down, almost was worse than, you know, uh, what it was. But for Tulane, they, they're going to give up two games. Um, it'll be against Texas A&M and G- Grambling. Uh, they will get ready uh, for the next, you know, the next, the new year, if you will. That's when they're going to get rolling on January 1st. However, I feel like we saw this a little bit last year. Um, this was kind of the first step before they play again. It kind of comes out, you know what, we're just going to shut it down because I do think they're going to get together, look at things. And at at what point do you kind of measure the risks? Um, We also see Mick Cronin at UCLA, the head coach there. He has entered um, COVID protocol. He will miss at least one game um, for the Bruins. So my question to you, Raider Jim, at at what point, you know, obviously with basketball being a indoor sport, um, do we have to ask that question? You know, when do fans get reduced capacity or shut the fans out at all? Well, as you and I were talking yesterday before we got too far into uh, the NFL podcast, uh, I happened to write COVID protocols and procedures for my employer. So uh, baptism by fire, I have had to do a lot of research and studying and figured it out along with everybody else. And I will tell you what's even more concerning to me going into this season is the Delta variant was bad enough and ran roughshod over the entire world because it was so new. Well, this Omicron variant is nothing to to dismiss because even though it's on a lesser scale and there is success in fighting it, if you've been vaccinated, et cetera, it's a, a devious little thing. And apparently it will multiply faster and spread faster than the Delta virus did or the Delta strain did. So that's a concern because you still have Delta very active. You have Omicron, which is, so so now you're getting it on two fronts, two different enemies, uh, all fighting the same battle, and that is to take out your system. So what do I think about it as far as an indoor sport? I happen to also run commercial facilities as for my livelihood, and I will tell you one of my concerns is the maintenance, and, and I'm sure all the arenas, all the venues have nothing but the highest caliber engineers, but it's that recirculating of the air within the arena. Uh, what type of maintenance are they doing? How frequency? What have they stepped? I can tell you that the, the folks that run the campus where I'm at, they came right out within the first 30 days of COVID shutdowns and things and said, if you're wondering, this is what we're doing to the system. And they went uh, full bore the best they can do with filters, frequency changes in the filters, maintaining flushing out water systems and things like that. And, and just to be safe, though, you really need to consider how many people do you want in there breathing? Because the, the more people you have, the greater strain there's going to be on your equipment. So uh, 
I, I can see this going, unfortunately, the way of last year or certain parts of last year. UCLA, Alabama State canceled. That game is done. Uh, Seton Hall, the number 16 Seton Hall Pirates canceled the game uh, against Rick Pitino and Iona this coming Saturday. They may have to cancel their Big East opener on the 20th and St. John's on the 23rd. Uh, excuse me, DePaul on the 23rd. St. John's is supposed to be on the 20th. Those games are in question. Gonzaga was supposed to play Washington last weekend. Did not happen because Washington has COVID. Ohio State, they were supposed to play Kentucky in Vegas this coming Saturday. Not going to happen, and they may not play Tennessee Martin on the 21st. Duke was supposed to play another warm-up game against the, uh, the Cleveland State team. Canceled. That's been replaced by Loyola, Maryland, but I mean, that's just in the matter of a week, the games that have been canceled due to COVID. So I, I think the NCAA has to step back and look because you're not isolating it to the Mountain West. You're not isolating it to the West Coast Conference. We just went global. We just went coast to coast here. We went Duke, we went UCLA. We're going uh, Pacific Northwest. So, wow, it, it doesn't look promising. And any of those teams right now, as we speak, Thursday, December 16th, it could be one or two more, uh, uh, you know, whatever uh, positive test away from saying we're shutting it down for two weeks, like Tulane did. Uh, Cause right now it's kind yeah. of that, Hey, maybe this will be done in a week and we can just tell everyone we're not playing you, you know, best of luck here, split the money, however they figure that out. But, you know, at some point, you know, if it doesn't get better, then, yeah, you are going to have to shut things down. And as the later into the season we get, um, you know, with all due respect to Tennessee Martin, but I don't think we need to see Tennessee Martin play a big time team. But do you want to miss out? You know, it, it's kind of like last year with with ba Baylor and Gonzaga. They were supposed to meet in, I believe, November or early December. Never happened. And we all were mad or not mad, but we we're we had a whole season of kind of fresh, sure. or a sports season of frustration, but it was, it was unfortunate, but we all kind of said, or at least I said, if we have to sacrifice this game in November to get March madness and eventually get Baylor Gonzaga, who were the two best teams on the biggest scale, because whatever preseason tournament or, you know, game that was pales in comparison to what you're going to see at any point in March. So we gave that up to get that. So, for me, at least, it's kind of, you know, I don't want to sound callous about it, but maybe, okay, everybody take a step back right now. Let's get ready for conference play. And going back to what you brought up with the, the filtration systems and things like that, everybody breathing, not only breathing, we're not watching tennis here. This isn't golf. This is, you know, look at Duke, look at pretty much any student section in the top 40, 50. You're going to have students on their feet in small confines screaming uh, i mean you know for when the team's on defense it's 25 seconds of essentially just screaming um that is and then conversely if you say okay you have to wear a mask that's detrimental to their health i mean obviously you want to tell them look you're wearing a mask you got to calm it down but you know it's it's hard to explain it's, and how do they how do they get from hotel to venue yeah Let's and, and all then, get on the bus and, and, and sit like this. Mm -hmm. it's, and, yeah. and then you're going to sit here and tell these kids, no, you can't play because you got, um, you tested positive for COVID and they go, well, coach, 24 hours ago, we lost the game and they stormed the court. I couldn't get off the court without right. being elbow to elbow with somebody. Now, once again, I'm not, this isn't, it's just such a tough area. However, there is, what there is a, a solution to pr not all of this but a good amount of this and it is at the very least limited capacity um I, we talked last night about the nfl i think when the nfl when you're talking about 65 70 000 people and at the very least let's say average of 200 dollars a ticket and that's probably low um that's a lot of money now college basketball they're more booster based more you know i mean they're still going to be taking a hit don't get me wrong but this isn't a situation where the nfl they could possibly say look we know we should be doing the right thing but we're staying to lose billions of dollars and once again is it the right thing to do no do i understand it yeah gray area for sure but i think with college basketball they have to these are once again amateurs 
amateur athletes. Right. Um, they are not getting paid. I know the NIL have come out. We know that, but a lot of these kids are not getting paid. Um, so we should at least at the very least make their sport as safe as possible. It's unfortunate, um, especially for a lot of people who, 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 you know, have March madness plans or even that, but I'd rather see the games happen than, than, you know, and just like it did two years ago without really any conclusion. So. And, and poor Rick Pitino finally starting to become uh, irrelevant again. And look what happens. Lost his big stage on Saturday. Well, that was going to be his chance to go in there and play Seton Hall and see if he could compete with them and, and maybe pull off the upset. And, and he's now he's, I guess he's gone out on Twitter or somewhere and said, look, anybody want to play? Yeah, we'll play. We just want to yeah. play. And, 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 you know, that's the mentality. Even Gonzaga, I understand coach view, uh, even though they got the Texas tech game coming up real soon here, but even he has said, Hey, anybody want to do one more game? We're, yeah. we're, we're ready. Let's do it. So it, it's a shame. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's very hard for these young men, uh, especially the ones who have stuck around had to go through it once, uh, the Drew Timmies of the world, it's his last season, and, you know, all this, you know, just to be stuck in limbo, you don't know if you're going to get to play a complete season, how it's going to play out. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but I, I think the other unfortunate part is, I mean, at least myself, I'm never a big fan of bringing up a problem unless I have a solution, and I think the solution is there, it's just a question of will it actually be taken down, because um, with all due respect to the NCAA, I've never expected them to put player safety ahead of uh, the pocketbook. But moving on to some bat on the court stuff, of course, we'll start at the top with some rankings. Obviously, I believe this is the fifth or sixth AP poll that has come out, and we already have our fourth new number one team of the year. It is, of course, the defending national champion Baylor Bears after um, writing a nine game winning streak and dominating my Villanova Wildcats. That was a, uh, my goodness, sitting down, expecting to see a really good basketball game. And um, look, I, I love Baylor, but they are never going to be uh, mistaken for a, a team that's going to win any shootout and they can, but uh, they, if they'd like, if they want to, they're going to ground and pound you, if you will, uh, holding Villanova to only 36 points. They are the new number one um, behind them. You have Duke at eight and one Purdue at nine and one UCLA nine and one as well. And Gonzaga at eight and two to round out the top five, couple other uh, little notes. Uh, Houston goes from unranked to number 14. Uh, they only lost by one to Alabama. That I believe is the only reason they were brought in. So yeah. um, congratulations to them moving all the way from unranked to number 14 without actually winning a game. Good for them. Uh, and then at the bottom, uh, if you, if you would have said a, Mountain West team's going to jump out to a 10 and 0 start and be ranked um, in uh, mid December. I think most people would have figured it would have been uh, San Diego State, but it's Colorado State at 10 and 0. They've beaten Creighton, St. Mary's, and Mississippi State already this year, so they look uh, look to be off to a you know very good start and possibly for real. We'll see how it goes with Mountain West play coming up. But Raider Jim, your thoughts on the early season rankings? Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm fine with Gonzaga and at number five, quite honestly, I would have started Baylor at number one myself. Yeah. Gonzaga lost a couple key players. Uh, but, but, you know, just by virtue of, of the phenom Chet Holmgren, I think that's why they got the number one to start with. They had Holmgren, they had the return of Timmy. They thought it was going to be like, you know, big brother, little brother, and we're going to go take over the world. Uh, and uh, my son, again, who was an alum of, of Gonzaga and very familiar with the program, and, and he had said to me, he goes, no, these, these kids are going to, this team's going to drop a couple. He says they might even drop a couple in conference. So, you know, of course, you don't want to see your team lose, but uh, it, we aren't real surprised by what has happened already. It's a statement game, I think, already for them, though, depending on what they do against Texas Tech this coming weekend. And then as far as Colorado State goes, I will tell you, that coach has put together one phenomenal team and he has everybody back from last year. And, you know, if people who didn't really follow uh, the conference that well, all you got to do is think back to right after the new year when they were down by 26 points to San Diego State, the powerhouse of the conference, and they came back. They not only caught them, they beat San Diego State by three points in that game. You talk, and again, wow, that sent a message to the team. You know, after the after that, it was just like, wow. And then they kind of got, 
the the luck of the COVID draw at the end where they had to play like, you know, seven games in seven nights, it seemed like. They just got run roughshod and ended up losing a thriller to Nevada, and, you know, at the last couple minutes or couple seconds even. Uh, but that is a fantastic program. The other one that you're going to see uh, before too long, I think, that's going to probably creep into the top 25, the other 10 and 0 team, it's going to be the University of San Francisco yeah. out of the West Coast Conference. Let me tell you, West Coast Conference is posturing itself to have Brigham Young, St. Mary's, University of San Francisco, and Gonzaga all making a case for should they be in the tournament. So don't be surprised if Mountain West doesn't end up, or excuse me, West Coast doesn't end up with three teams in the tournament when all is said and done. Uh, the, the top 10, though, I, I think it's very fair. I think it's, uh, you know, Duke is still there, regardless if you let kids play who were uh, driving around under the influence or driving other people around under the influence, and then are allowed to make statements like, I would do it again. If I got put in that situation, I would do it again. Well, you know what? Sometimes people don't like the entitled school when they act entitled. And that's very much what that was. And it's a shame because, uh, and, and then with that, that blood tie to Coach K, it's really too bad that he was allowed to say something like that without being reprimanded, you know, in the media eye yeah. by the university. Yeah, uh, it was, uh, that's, you know, like I always say, look, guys, you're not under oath. We want you to be truthful, but gosh. Yeah. <laughs> pretend, yeah. just pretend. I mean, <laughs> once again, no one's, no one's going to, you know, sue you for perjury because we kind of call bullshit. I mean, just anyways. Uh, yeah, that, that was tough, but I, I want to take it back to Baylor. I agree with you. Baylor is a team right now that I think they have, when you have two guards that are over six, eight, I mean, that's, that, that's mind boggling to me. Um, when you have Kendall Brown freshman, who was number 10 overall, I believe in either this recruiting class or the, uh, 2021. Yeah. So it would have been this past recruiting class. And then Matthew Mayer, who's a senior, you know, big talented senior guards, they tend to kind of reign in March. And we saw it last year, uh, uh, with Baylor as well. I'm really excited to see what they can do if they can kind of be that team. It's been so long since we've seen, I think. I want to say it was the Florida, the Joakim Noah, Al Horford, Corey Brewer, Florida yeah. teams. And with all due respect to this Baylor team, that Florida team, th there was never a doubt, at least that second year, when they all announced they were coming back, there was never a doubt they were going to lose to anybody. I think they ended up beating Greg Oden's Ohio State team. It was either the first year or the second year. But this team, I do think there is a little bit um, more of that question mark. And I think a lot of what it is, is that offense um, I, I think a lot of people want to see that, that, you know, the old kind of Kentucky, the Anthony Davis's teams that average 85 points a game, things like that. Baylor isn't going to do that. They can, but once again, like we saw against Villanova, if it's up to them, they are going to grind you into, you know, a, a stew. And by the end of right. it, it's two minutes left in the game. And, and, you know, most of your guys are in foul trouble and everyone else who's on the floor is, is wore out because they've just been grinded down. Um, and, and I think if that's the recipe for success, uh, I, I can't imagine. I, I, ironically enough, Virginia Commonwealth is the only team that's kept Baylor within 10 points or been within 10 points of Baylor. Um, and Baylor's played some really, really good teams. And for Gonzaga, I, there's, they seem to be just kind of a team of extremes, at least in the media's eye or the way the media treats them. I, I, I feel like they're either the greatest team ever, or they're overrated. There's never like, okay, they're, they're right where they should be. And I think they are right where they should be. Look, they beat yes. UCLA by 20 and their two losses were to Duke and Alabama. I, I mean, none of those losses are keeping them out or costing them a seed come March. Right. Um, and once again, this isn't the BCS. Uh, you don't automatically lose, or I guess college football playoff. Now you don't automatically get eliminated for losing two games. I think it's good for this team. You talked about the youth on this team. Character. Good, builds character 100 percent. because guess what no matter how good you are in march you're going to go into a timeout with 90 seconds left look around and go guys we have to be on our game or we're done and if you're not put into that situation during the season it, it makes it more difficult um to get to that point um in march where it is truly crunch time so that works for them that they've kind of faced a little bit of adversity and another thing that i think is going to work out for gonzaga is something you touched on is the strength of your conference. It's been, you know, look, BYU came into the conference and St. Mary's has always been that team. But for the most part, 
there hasn't been a, a, a tried and true competitor that's always going to be there as well to play them tough besides BYU and St. Mary's. We've had Pepperdine. We've had even San Francisco in the past, but it's never been consistent. This year, like you said, it could be. And look, don't sleep on San Diego. University of San Diego, they've dropped a couple um, that they probably should have won, but they had a big win and it kind of escapes me off the top of my head, even though I live like two miles from the campus. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's something that the West Coast Conference it's kind of the spoils of Gonzaga saying, you know yes. what, we oh, might yeah. not be able to go to Gonzaga, but if I go to St. Mary's, if I go to San Francisco, besides the fact that every campus on the West coast conference is beautiful. I mean, I feel like that's a prerequisite besides being a private college. You're also probably going to need to be absolutely gorgeous. The campus. Um, you also get a chance to play Gonzaga. You're going to play on ESPN as well. So uh, I, I think everyone's kind of reaping the spoils of the success that Gonzaga has had on in the West coast. Absolutely. Conference. And uh, I think um, it's going to be a fantastic conference here. I agree with you. I think actually the Mount or the West Coast Conference is probably, you know, I'll call it the bit of the resurgence of the Pac-12, um, but they're right there with the Pac-12 because I don't think, I mean, even with you're going to sit here and tell me Oregon was the preseason favorite. Right, right. Talk to BYU about that. But um, moving on to uh, kind of piggybacking on that with Gonzaga, as we send it over, of course, to Raider Jim, who always follows the Bulldogs. Um, with family ties and always been a fan as well. So what's going on uh, a little deeper there in Spokane? Yeah, you know, there's really not a bunch of news. The big news is that they're trying to find a game to fill in and, and they're getting ready for this Texas Tech game. Drew Timmy is playing like Drew Timmy. He's, he's going to be out there. He's going to mug for the camera and do stuff. He's almost like a pro wrestler. Yeah. He's not doing any of that stuff seriously when he flexes or does the mustache thing. Uh, Holmgren, for as slight and skinny of a kid as he is, boy, he's proven to be a pretty tough character. He can stand in there with some people. Uh, and he has already. And then they have a couple other folks, uh, you know, that are still, of course, now the, the names are uh, escaping me, which is not a good thing. But uh, they've got some, they've got support players. They've got four players right now that are averaging in double figures. And that's key. One thing that I've seen where they need to be careful is the free throws. They're not as strong at the free throw line like they used to be. And that has kind of been a pattern with them over the last few years. Back in the early teens of 2000, the 98 team, things like that, they had a kid on the, on the uh, I believe it was the 03, 04 team, Derek Rivio, whose dad coached at uh, Portland for a while. Rivio was like a 94% free throw shooter. I mean, this kid was lights out. And, and when you talk about something like that, what else makes Colorado State the number 23 team so dangerous right now? They're a 44% team from the three-point line, from the three-point range. And that is number one in the country. They are at 82% from the free throw line, fourth in the country. So Gonzaga has to pay attention to some of those little details like that. And uh, they're going to be fine. Like I say, you're number five. It's not like you have anything to hang your head about. And Coach View doesn't let his teams hang their heads. They're going to be trained. They're going to be able to compete. And, uh, and, and I'm sure they're going to have just a fine season, but a much more competitive league schedule than they may have been used to of the last five, six years. Definitely. And uh, it's, it's a good problem to have when you're a program that sits number five in the country and there's certain people with their arms going, what is going on? The sky is falling. I mean, yeah. talk about a bit of an embarrassment of riches. Uh, and there are plenty and, and of one more thing on USF, talking about yeah. West Coast Conference just a little bit longer, at 10-0, and 0, uh, their coach is the, the aged 36-year-old Todd Golden. Todd Golden was on the 08 St. Mary's team, so he played for Randy Bennett. That's going to be a heck of a game. If it was closer one way or the other, I would pay to go watch that because <laughs> that's going to be a great game to see player play against or, you know, coach against his yeah. former coach. Golden also played for Bruce Pearl in the USA uh, Open team that won the 09 gold medal. So he's, he's one of those, uh, you, you know, he eats basketball. He studies it. He's a great student of the game. Plus, he can execute and play the game. They got a great guy running that team right now. So it should, uh, again, uh, watch that team. At 10-0 already, it's going to be a competitive West Coast Conference. Yeah, can't wait to break that all down throughout the season, of course, with Raider Jim. Uh, myself, obviously, keeping an eye on San Diego State. 
Uh, it's been a it's been a tough one for them, at least recently. Uh, they are currently six and three. They don't have any bad losses. Uh, like I'll be honest, um, they uh, do have a win over Georgetown. Um, what's that worth? I don't really know. Georgetown. It's definitely not the Patrick Ewing. Uh, I mean, it is Patrick Ewing's Georgetown, but not his playing uh, Patrick Ewing Georgetown. Definitely not the blue blood it used to be. They did get that win. They have lost to Michigan. They have lost to BYU and they have lost to USC. Once again, no losses there are going to keep them out, but they kind of needed one or two of those um, because now they're looking at a spot where you got to, you know, pretty much go 15 and three in conference um, to kind of be in uh, a safe team in that conference, uh, probably get a win or two over Colorado state. So setting itself up, but there are two more non-conference games before uh, things get rolling. It is of course, one of them is St. Mary's that will be tomorrow night, Friday, the 17th of December. Keep an eye on that one. That will be a big showdown as St. Mary's has been very good this year. Um, even with, I think they're lost to Colorado state, but they have got That's some at good wins. St. Mary's correct. Sorry. You're I believe so. Yes. St. Mary's. Yeah. Yes. Um, and then you also have finishing up against uh, UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Obviously not a team to look past, but I think St. Mary's will be the bigger test there. And then the new year will begin the conference play in the Mountain West. In terms of the play uh, players for the season so far, uh, Matt Bradley, I think, has been overall the best player. He's averaging 15 points and five rebounds. Uh, Nathan Mensa, obviously the big guy inside, not a big time scorer. Um, but he is a force, you know, on the boards, averaging seven points and seven rebounds. I will say for me, one of the, I guess, big time bright spots. And, you know, once again, this isn't, you know, a bad San Diego state team, just not the maybe start we're used to with them where they kind of get off to an 11 and one start or something like that. But sophomore Lamont Be Butler uh, has improved tremendously uh, so much that he's pretty much forced himself into the starting lineup, shooting 47% from three point range. Uh, he was, he only shot 29% all of last year. So big step up there, San Diego state. Um, that's kind of how they roll. They've never been a big team. And, you know, with, with all due respect to Nathan Mensa, uh, he's, he's kind of a walk inside to kind of rim protector, get those defensive rebounds, try for those offensive rebounds, but he's not going to be a guy that we'll talk about here in a few moments uh, that can absolutely dominate the inside. So I think it is more of that outside game. Trey Pulliam has also been playing well as well. Um, I just, I feel like there's always, every year, um, San Diego State has a player like Trey Pulliam that you, you're so reliant on how he's shooting from behind the arc and he, they get so streaky and there go two weeks where they're going to lose to Air Force and, and New Mexico. And, and it's just like, ah, what is going on? And it's because those streaky shooters are on their down. So I've always hoped that they could have two or three. I'm hoping Lamont Butler keeps this up. Once again, we are still early into this season. I think he's only played in, uh, I think he's only started five games, played in seven. So, you know, still a little small sample size, but if Lamont, Lamont Butler can even, you know, I mean, 47%, I highly doubt he'll keep that up for the rest of the year, but anything over 41, 42%, uh, that will be a plus for San Diego State right. heading into the conference um, schedule, a, a conference that I believe they were picked to win um, early season, big time test from Colorado State and plenty of others. San Diego State always seems to play down to certain places. And I will admit there are a lot of places in the Mountain West that are hard to travel to, um, not even crowd withstanding, uh, just driving in or flying into, um, you know, I don't know, big airport in Wyoming in a 25, you know, yeah. A, a long bus ride into Laramie in the middle of February, you know, getting your fingers crossed that the charter flight will even make it on time. Um, so there are a lot of things there. I can't tell you how many uh, stories you hear. Oh, San Diego state landed at three in the morning and uh, they, you know, had got four or five, six hours of sleep had to be here, you know, for shoot around at one game started, blah, blah, blah. So those things happen in the mountain West. The so San Diego states has to be ready for them. Uh, I as well will keep you updated on how that goes throughout the year, but definitely keep an eye on tomorrow's game, San Diego State at St. Mary's. Uh, but moving on to our player profile, we're bringing it back from last year, um, obviously highlighting the, some of the best players overall in the country. And we will start, at least in my mind, at the top. It is the big center out of Illinois, seven feet, 285 pounds, uh, Kofi Coburn, a native of Kingston, Jamaica, absolutely dominating this year. Really no big surprise, but really taking it to another level. 
averaging 21 points and 12 rebounds. Uh, he was suspended for the first three games. However, it was due to selling his jerseys at memorabilia. I mean, my goodness, it's, it's his property. But anyways, that's another story. Hardly the most egregious thing we've talked about on this podcast, but he did miss the first three games. Um, and Illinois missed him pretty, uh, pretty badly, unfortunately. They are six and three. They are currently unranked. They do have losses to Marquette, University of Arizona, and Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati beat them by 20. But Raider Jim, what are your thoughts on the big man from Illinois who at the very least might not, you know, win a national championship, but come March, you're not going to want to be matched up against this guy. This kid is a beast and he's <laughs> athletic all in, you know, it, he's just the whole package reminds me a lot of a young man that used to play for Gonzaga, Roni Turioff, the big man out of Martinique, France, and Turioff ended up going to play for the Lakers for a spell. Uh, but boy, that man, he, he was as big as he was, he could move, he could pivot, he had good feet, he had soft hands, uh, and he owned the boards, the paint was his, uh, no doubt about it, and that, that's how, I mean, you know, you watch this young man play, and that's it, uh, the only thing, uh, you mentioned the, the, the three-game suspension for, uh, you know, selling jerseys or whatever it was he did, and that was one of the losses for Illinois. Now, the interesting one, more interesting and more recent is Arizona, a team that we didn't really talk about a lot when we talked about the top 25, but that program seems to be rebounding this year. They're playing very well. They really kept not just Illinois in check, but they kept Cockburn in check. And it would be good to go back and watch some of that because I mean, they basically took him out of the game and there are going to be those teams then they're going to look at those films, focus on that. Did they box him out? How did we get inside? How did he, his shooting was, uh, you know, very, very subpar for what he would normally do. Uh, but they just, I think he only got 15 points that night or if he even got that. But uh, you can't say enough about him. You know, it's, it's the feel-good story. His mom went to Queens, New York in 09, and he didn't come to Queens, New York until I think it was five years later. And, you know, now he is. He's there from Jamaica. He gets the, the, the college scholarship. Wow. And let's just hope it plays out and there's no more infractions he has to deal with. And, and he's got the, the right people's attention and the right people are guiding him along the way. Yeah. I, and to be fair, I don't think any NBA scout is scared away of Kofi Coburn because he sold his jersey no, things like not that. Not at I'd all. Be more worried not at about all. in Poncho. Uh, is it Poncho? Pop, the, the gentleman down, I think it's Poncho Barrera down at um, Duke. Anyways, the gentleman who was with uh, Shashevsky Jr. Jr., at least his grandson right. or whatever. I would be a little more, that's more, a lot more egregious than Kofi Coburn. Probably, you know, somebody walks into his house and goes, I know someone will give you $1,500 for that jersey. Any 20-year-old in the world is going to take that, period. Right. And would do it again if it only cost them three games. And to be completely honest, maybe not for the team's sake, I understand that. But anyways, um, the big thing for me with Coburn is his... I, I, the game changed, obviously, I think it was last night or two nights ago, obviously Steph Curry breaks Ray Allen's three point record. And I think Steph Curry was kind of the, the game changer, the, this, the analytic part of, Hey, you can make half of your three point shots, but still, you know, where, however that lines up, it, it, it works out better, blah, blah, blah. And this it's trickled down, or in this case up, I believe in terms of height, because now the center position in the NBA is what used to be referred to as a stretch center or a stretch five where they can set the pick and roll, but they can step out and hit down head at three Joel Embiid, N N uh, Jokic. Uh, and, you know, I want to say even Anthony Davis, uh, I would say a heavy majority of centers in the NBA are that stretch five. Kofi Coburn is, he is a throwback. He is Patrick Ewing, you know, Ronnie Turioff. He is going to be in the paint and pivot and pivot, and you're going to get some elbows. You're going to get that strength. He has 285 pounds. Now, for contrast, Chet Holmgren is 190 pounds. Now, obviously, two different players, but that kind of goes to my point. Chet Holmgren, I think, is already – he averages almost three three-pointers a game, or at least attempts a right. game. So, obviously, once again, a big difference in, game, uh, in a, the way they play the game. But for me, I just think at this level – Big men have always been that factor. You know, obviously going back 
you know, Hakeem Olajuwon, Patrick Ewing, and even, you know, Anthony Davis, Greg Oden, who struggled, you know, with injuries at the next level, but the big men have always reigned supreme in this league. And I don't know if Illinois has enough talent there, but I tell you what, they're unranked right now. And if you are a big believer in them and you are a better, Hey, uh, now's the time because I think this team's going to start to get, once they get into big 10, they're going to start beating some teams that you go, Oh, they beat Purdue. Oh, they beat Ohio state. And, mm-hmm. and they're going to start working their way up. And this team's going to be a two or three seed. And you're going to go, darn, I wish I put something in on this team to win the national or, you know, a, a sweet 16 or elite eight, wherever, you know, wherever you see them now is the time because they are so undervalued, but going forward health and, you know, um, other stuff off the field stuff. If that stays okay, I think this team can do some things because uh, you can ride a guy like this. You can feed the post, Absolutely. feed the beast. And sometimes with guys, you have a seven footer, 285, missed shots are not the end of the world. As long as homeboy is down there in an arm's length, that might be one of your best offenses right there. It's like an outside inside reverse, you know, uh, try the three, couldn't do it. Kofi's there. He'll dunk it. All right, back at it. But anyway, so that could be something to keep an eye on. Uh, moving on to looking ahead to uh, the week um, for college basketball. Tomorrow, of course, I brought up the St. Mary's and San Diego State game. Saturday is chock full of great college basketball. Gonzaga at Texas Tech. We talked with you, Raider Jim, about that one. UCLA at North Carolina. Not exactly the blue blood North Carolina team, but still a very good team in first year with Hubert Davis. And Oklahoma be State. To see what happens or what will happen with the, the COVID scheduling. Yeah. I that's mean, that, true. You know, that game mm-hmm. may not even happen. And then what? And and I it's kind of a I only can go right play there. I only can go play North Carolina then. There you go. And, well, and I tell you what, be- I almost put Seton Hall and Iona on this list um because of that and then of course you just said it was canceled but even here in this one it would be a little disingenuous i think if you're alabama state and you go hey wait you didn't want to play us but you'll go play north carolina that right you know we all know what's going on there don't get me wrong it's not you know we, we don't have to dive too deep figure out what's what the reasoning is but i'd still feel a little slight if i'm alabama now i'm sure there was a check written to Alabama State, Alabama State, I should say, not Alabama, but I'm sure there was a check written to Alabama State, and they said, you know what, be healthy, um, and then move on to the next one, but right. uh, so hopefully that game will go off, uh, that'll be an interesting one, Oklahoma State, Houston, um, Baylor at Oregon, obviously Oregon has had some big time issues, but I tell you what, if they can get one against Baylor, uh, that would be at least something they can say, look, we're at least turning the direction, uh, next week, Two, one, uh, two big ones will be USC and Oklahoma State, and then Arizona at Tennessee will be on Wednesday. Raider Jim, I know Saturday you're going to be watching your Zags, and uh, but other than that game, which of these or any other games in the following week or in this coming week are you most excited for? You know, I, I'm curious to see how well uh, Oregon comes out and plays against Baylor. That is one that's on my radar. I want to see, I, I got to believe Oregon's a little better than what they have performed so far. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be more of a test for, well, potentially could be more of a test for Baylor than what they might be anticipating. And is Baylor going to go in and look past Oregon? That's something that uh, it will, it's just going to, we'll have to wait and see. And again, that Wednesday game, Arizona, Tennessee, also going to be a good game. Tennessee, very, very up and down. Um, yes. I, I th- they've lost a couple, but then they beat the snot out of North Carolina, I believe. So very, very up and down. And then obviously Arizona undefeated. This is, I mean, I want to say in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen Arizona be what nine and oh, and kind of quietly. I mean, we, we kind of went through this whole thing and we've, we've mentioned them, but normally, you know, when you see Arizona at nine and oh, it's, they're the best team on the West coast. And it just kind of shows that things have, you know, kind of switched to UCLA and not switch, but Gonzaga definitely up there. UCLA is kind of that top dog um in the pac 12 and i think it also does speak to how low and how down pac 12 basketball is right now um not last year's tournament withstanding when you know it seemed like they just turned the world upside down on its head with oregon state uh did they make the final four it was was only like three months ago four months ago and i've already forgotten but anyways um you know they sneak into the tournament as a 12 seed and they get to it at the very least the elite eight 
a great run the Pac-12. Fantastic stuff. But, but watch, I mean, look at the, cumu the cumulative records of UCLA, USC, and Arizona right yeah. now. Boy, that, that's a calling card yeah. for Pac-12. So It's going to be a good one. And, you know, I mean, it'd be in a, in a perfect world, Oregon would be doing their part as well. Yes. But that's not the case. But I agree with you on Oregon versus Baylor. It's kind of the, the wounded animal, the you know, the cornered wolf, so to speak really nothing to lose for Oregon. If they go out and lose by 20 to Baylor, we just go, yeah, we expected that. You lost by 20 to BYU. Why wouldn't you lose by 20 to the top right. in the country? If they go out and lose by five, oh, hey, look what's going on. If they win this game, we kind of forget that they started five and five. I think the narrative then becomes, well, when the game, when the chips are down, this team can show up. So we'll see how that goes. I agree with you. I think that game probably under a lot of people's radar um, I also do really like the UCLA, North Carolina, hopefully assuming it goes off, yeah. um, but I'm not fully, you know, look, Saturdays, this Saturday coming up, it's going to be, I don't know how Raider Jim's going to do it. Um, I don't know what the, is it 11 o'clock start for Gonzaga? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it, it might work out. Hopefully it'll work out. Cause I think the Raider game starts at what one or one 30. If they're the second game. No, they're the first. I know they're the first. Cause the, then it's going to be a 10 o'clock night. Okay. Okay. Then yeah, yeah it should be a one o'clock game. Yeah. So uh, Raider Jim will uh, hope that a nice tidy victory for Gonzaga. There's none of the old uh, foul, the hack and slash for turning the last two minutes into a 40 minute uh, situation and add extra uh, stress to Raider Jim's day. Hopefully he gets a nice two and oh Saturday in there, but final thoughts, Raider Jim for uh, this edition of in the paint. Who would have thought we'd already passed a, uh, uh, you know, pre-conference play. Yeah, this is amazing. Going into it, this is it. It's all going to start counting. And, you know, every game matters, as we all say. And some of the conferences have already had one or two conference games. But, uh, wow, uh, talk to us in a week because it's, it's going to be, you know, no holds barred and everybody's out of the gate. Yeah, it's going to be a, a great run. And I think last year it was, I don't want to sit in set in stone, but as set in stone as March Madness can be, that the top two teams in the country, are Baylor and Gonzaga all year. We, you think Baylor's better. You think Gonzaga's better. That's fine. But nobody could say that any other team, nobody could say that Illinois was better than one of those two teams this year. I mean, you could sit here and say USC is the best team in the country. And you know what? You might not be wrong. There's so many things. So I think this year heading into it, if we keep up this pace, um, you know, you might have eight, 10, 12 teams who could be getting a lot of looks uh, for a national championship and, I mean, that's all we need, right? More madness to add to right. March Madness. So we are getting, of course, every, every step closer, one week closer to the best sporting event in the world, in my mind, in March Madness. But we'll be with you all the way into that lead up, heading up to then. But we are done for this episode. But thank you so much for listening to this edition of the In the Paint podcast presented by the First Off the Bench Podcast Network. Everyone comes off the bench, but we are first it's time for you all to go wash your hands and stop hating everybody. We'll talk to you all very soon. Take care. Happy holidays and be safe. Amen.